Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, uh, Kerbal Alarm Clock had just reminded me that I have a burn here to do with the Kegel 5. And that burn is going to set me on an intercept course with the Kermes 1, my crude vessel on its way to Drez. And what we are doing here, because we are working with a 12 and a half second light delay, thanks to our distance from Kerbin and using remote tech. So we're using the remote tech flight computer to execute this particular maneuver. Just a few seconds away. And there we go. Sorry about the no sound. My sound card's been getting confused lately, though I think I have got it resolved now. So a little later in this video, pretty soon, you'll be starting to get sound once again. All right, that is it. Why don't we get up the remote tech uh, rendezvous, or not the remote tech, sorry, the Kerbal Engineer rendezvous information. There we go. That's the button I'm looking for. Oh, we are, oh, we're only about 625 kilometers away from the Kermes 1. Let's take a look at our situation here. We're going to be meeting them in about two hours. Our closest approach is going to be 12 kilometers, encountering at 78 meters per second. All right, well, why don't we set ourselves up an alarm. Get up alarm clock here, set an alarm for an hour from now. And then we'll take a look at the situation at that point, see if we can not close that distance just a little bit further. And while I'm doing that, just kind of remind people of what the situation is. The reason why I'm doing this goes all the way back to episode 93, where a staging mishap on the Kermes 1 ditched two full radial tanks of fuel. So the Kermes 1 is left with not enough fuel in which to uh, perform its mission to get a capture around Drez and collect a whole ton of science and then get itself back to Kerbin. So what I'm doing is I'm going to be bringing in my planned lander, this vessel right here, to sort of dock up with it so that we can uh, transfer over some fuel so hopefully we can uh, get these folks back home safely. Also this episode, I have a moon buggy that I'll be launching and sending its way, obviously, to the moon. We'll get it down onto the surface, and we'll deal with that once we get this rendezvous out of the way. But I got this uh, second burn here. Oh, we're now 30 kilometers away from the Kermes. And just, what I got here? Five seconds for the burn. There we are. So we'll wait for this to complete. Once again, of course, using the flight computer execute mode because of the signal delay. You know, the flight computer does do a nice job of throttling down here right at the end of the burn. Nicely done. And then it kills the rotation automatically for you as well. Okay, let's check out the situation here. So... Our closest approach is now 2.4 kilometers, and that's going to be in about 20 minutes. I then just set up one more very quick burn, mostly just to reduce my relative velocity just a little bit more. All right, so now our relative velocity is 8.6 seconds at closest approach, which is now less than 2 kilometers. I think from here on, though, I'm going to switch over to the Kermes because it's crude. I don't have to deal with the signal delay anymore, so I think the whole matching velocities at the end here will be best done with the Kermes matching velocities with the Kegel rather than the other way around. But really this part, not too different from any other rendezvous, in many ways it's easier because our trajectories are so close to being straight lines this far out from any gravitational bodies. Now there is no RCS on the Kermes. So once I got in around under 150 meters or so, it was time to send somebody over to fly the Kegel over to here. Now the Kermes does not have a probe core, so it requires a pilot. So that means that the person flying over is going to be our engineer, Glafia. 
So we'll get her over there. Of course, shuffling the Kegel over wasn't any kind of an issue. One slight complication is that this large dish antenna is actually right on top of the docking port. So Glafia is going to have to get out there and detach it. I don't have a foreseeable use for it, but, you know, waste not, want not. So we'll stick it to the side of the Kermes. Of course, we have to shuffle in alongside here nice and close and bring it to a relative stop. That ought to do it. All right, Glafia, let's get this done. Then we can get you inside. All right, so oh, okay, I'm pressing H, but I'm not getting it to turn blue. I'm not getting that indication that it wants to connect there. Ah, uh, screw it, just do it anyway. Ah, uh, no, 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 Lafia, go get it. Ah, uh, see if she can nudge it up. Ah, uh, no, screw it, it's gone. Goodbye. I don't care. We'll just let her go. Can I drop this stupid parachute that she's carrying too? No, it won't let me drop that. Uh, okay, you know what? Forget this. Oh, I don't like the way the Kegel is drifting towards that radiator. Nope, nope, nope. No more screwing about. Let's just get this thing docked. And start seeing what we have as far as our fuel reserves go. We'll start by taking out all the fuel from this transfer vehicle. I'm hoping... And once that's done, that I'll actually have enough fuel to perhaps hang on to this lander. It'd be great to still be able to do a crewed landing, but we'll just have to see what we got once we get got rid of the uh, transfer vehicle. So there we go. There's all of that fuel. It's now gone. Transfer vehicle is now empty. Now, I would love to get rid of this debris, so I'm just going to adjust my course so that we are colliding with Dresden, and that way I'll detach that transfer vehicle and crash it into Dresden and pretend this has all never happened. Now the vessel does have a tendency to yaw with not even that much thrust, which of course is not surprising. I got a whole extra vehicle stuck there to the side, quite a way out from the central axis, like a pendulum bob. So clearly that's going to throw off the center of mass. But with just little thrusts and then the odd, and then correcting it back, should be able to get this done. Now I figure I want about 6 kilometers per second to feel safe that I can get these folks into a capture around Drez and then get them back to Kerbin safely. So I figure with Delta V budgets in the kilometers per second, I can afford the, what is it, five meters per second that this is costing. We're oh, getting close here, another little puff. Whoa, 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 okay, let's use some RCS to sort of dial that in a little bit more to the center. Oh, that on, that's got to do it. Okay, so let's detach. It's away. Okay, let's switch over to the debris. And, oh, wait, uh, i got to disengage the camera focus. Well, where are we going? Oh, my gosh, I think we're on our way out to that stupid antenna that Glafia got rid of. Okay, there we go. Let's check. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, so that was clearly an entire waste of time there. Oh, my gosh. Let's see what our Delta V situation is. So we got fuel here. Okay, that's just an advantage. Oh, there's fuel here. Oh, and that's on the other side of some docking ports. Let's uh, transfer that fuel down to closer where the engines are. There we go. Okay, so according to Kerbal Engineer, got about 4.6 kilometers per second. Oh, that's not encouraging. Again, I want about six kilometers per second. Okay, let's do some figuring. Now, if I add up all the fuel that I have, and I have 9,523 units of fuel, and I know 200 units is one metric ton, so that transfers over to 47.615 metric tons of reaction mass. The vessel is 25 or 95.69 tons, and the ISP of the engines that I have on here, 
the interstellar engines are 676.3 seconds. So, a little bit of calculating got me 4,570 meters per second at delta V. I guess uh, engineers right. Shoot. Okay, we need more delta V. Okay, well let's uh, let's get rid of the lander here. And without the lander, we have 5,320 meters per second. Okay, so we'll redock the Kegel. We might as well keep it for now. But I do have another vessel that's on an intercept course with us, namely the Drez one. Obviously also on a course towards Drez. And checking it out here, it has 613 units of liquid fuel. That's another 3.065 tons of reaction mass. And without dragging the Kegel along, that would give the Kermes delta V would be up to 5,450 meters per second. Ooh, still not, I think, yeah, hanging on to the lander. I really wanted to hang on to this lander, but clearly that is not going to be in the cards. If you don't know how to do these calculations, I do have a video where I derive the rocket equation, which is the equation that I'm using and show you how to use it. You might want to check that out. But in the meantime, there's still some liquid fuel on the Kegel itself. So we might as well start draining that over, see what that gets us up to. And I can't forget about there's these little Oscar B's hidden down here and there's a round eight underneath the materials bay. I want to get sure to get all the fuel. And now with that and the fuel from the Dres 1, that would give me 51.9846 tons of reaction mass, which translates to a delta V of 5,544 meters per second. Potentially doable. I'd have to look into it in a little bit more detail. Of course, then I'm completely sacrificing the Dres 1's mission as well, and I have some contracts for that, some remote tech contracts. Oh. Well, I see two options, really. I can get all of my available reaction mass onto the Kermes, go for a capture, and just kind of hope for the best that I can get them back. Hopefully, I'll have to look into the numbers and see if that's doable. Or I can keep enough reaction mass on the Kermes to just do a flyby. I'll have to figure out how much that will be. And then give enough fuel to the Dres 1 so it would have no trouble doing its mission. And then I'd be able to bang off those contracts. We'll have to ditch the lander either way. But you know what? I'll hang on to it for now because it's the only thing with some RCS. And I still have a rendezvous to do with the Dres 1. So having that RCS will be useful. And speaking of that rendezvous. With that, we will be encountering the Kermes 1 in just under 13 days. And at that time, I will have to make a decision. That will clearly have to be for the future, because right now, well, we have a launch to get to. Underneath that rather large fairing is my moon buggy. And this is actually my first real shot at a rover that's doing anything else than just driving around near the Kerbal Space Center. I generally find ro rovers in Kerbal Space Program not to be that particularly useful because it's easier just to kind of hop between biomes in most places and the biomes tend to be fairly big. But on the moon, you know, doing the hops are kind of expensive. So if you can put a rover down somewhere where there are multiple biomes fairly close by, then the rover becomes pretty useful. And as you're likely noticing, it is not crewed. That's because the crew is out there already orbiting. They've been orbiting the uh, in the Korion 3 about the moon for quite some time. And they don't even have a lander that's fueled. That's still for a future mission. But in the meantime, we will put this thing down on the surface of the moon. Uh, I don't know. I still have to decide upon a landing location for it. Just checking that smart parts did their job. Seems like things are good, so let's detach. Oh, we're on the booster. Let's get to the actual vessel here. It's a little bit unorthodox. It's controlled from this probe here right at the middle. That's actually oriented 90 degrees to the cockpit. I'll explain that in just a little bit. 
We'll deploy our antenna and point that at Kerbin. Kerbin, Kerbin. Oh, wait, these, no, I've gone past it. There it is, Kerbin, okay. There we go. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at it. It can hold three Kerbals. It has a lot of the surface science pack stuff in a container there towards the back. Several days of life support. Little platform to mount said science on top of so we can drive it around and collect it up. Ah, a little weird looking, I think, right here. It always looks weird when you're driving rovers about. Anyway, we'll set up our Moonar injection burn and reorient ourselves towards that maneuver node. Now you can sort of see it is a little bit, a little bit weird looking, I think, <laughs> the way it's orienting with the control point being midway like that. But it flies just fine. It's a pretty simple matter to adjust where those Rockomax radial engines are so that the center of thrust still lines up to the center of mass. And since the two tanks on either side are exactly the same, it'll drain fuel for them equally. So the center of mass will say, centered on the center of thrust and this thing will fly just fine without having to worry about atmospheres and things like that once you are out in a vacuum and with that burn complete it was time to set up a mid-course correction not being sure where i want to put this down i want to give myself maximum flexibility so i want to insert myself into a polar orbit but what we'll do is we'll just time warp out to that correction burn it's not too far into the future orient again to the node, and start the burn. Okay, maneuver node's not going down. Thrust up. Still not going down. Wait, what's going? Oh, hang on, we're going radially here. Stop, stop. What the heck is going on here? Oh, no. Oh, I hate you. Yeah, let's change set control to here. Yep, that was it. KSP set the control point back to the cockpit. Oh man, I hate that. Okay, um, how am I gonna correct for this? Should I, should I just burn normal? I still got the maneuver. No, maybe what I should no, I'll put it back onto the maneuver node. See if we can not recover. Come on, get back on there. There we go. Okay, let's burn. Uh, no, I don't think this is a very good idea. Maybe I should just try burning radially out. Forget the whole trying to put it into a polar orbit thing. Just get it out so that my periapsis isn't inside the moon. But that turned out to be even a worse idea. Oh my gosh, God, I'm, I'm wasting too much fuel here. What I should do is just set up another maneuver node. That's the safer thing to do. And just get my periapsis out of the moon. That's all I need to do. Okay, let's get rid of the node. Gotta go a little bit more. All right, that'll do. All right, now, according to the en Kerbal Engineer, I have 1,017 meters per second left. That is both for capture and to land. That is going to be tight. So just cut to being inside the moon's sphere of influence. All right, so we'll do my circularization. I'll set up an alarm for periapsis. There we go. All right, and let's just time warp down there, circularize, and then we can get a better feel of what the situation is. I am in a hurry here. Wait, 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 what? whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, Kerbal alarm clock's not turning things off. Stop, 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 stop. What the heck? Okay, I'm going up now. I'm clearly past periapsis. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I obviously messed up with the alarm. Uh, you folks can go back with the video and check what happened. I'm just making sure my control point's still what it's supposed to be because I don't need any more mess ups. Okay, let's start burning retrograde. I'm not captured. <laughs> I gotta make this burner. We're whipping past the moon. 
Oh my goodness, this is turning into a fiasco. Please don't let my screw-ups mess up this mission. I really, really, really want a rover. Okay, uh, we got a capture. Uh, but my periapsis is starting to go up now. Let's uh, try pitching a little bit. Burn this way. No, 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 that's making it worse. Pitch the other way. I always get messed up. I'm going backwards. Okay, that seems all right. I don't want my periapsis to get too low. Okay, still bringing down that apoapsis. Ah, my periapsis is starting to go down again. No, 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 just stop. Okay, let's adjust the pitch a little bit more. Try that again. No, 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 periapsis is still going down. No, no, no. We're, no, 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 none of this is working. Give it up, give it up, give it up. We got our capture. I don't need to keep fronting around with this. We got a capture. Everything is good. Okay, let's set an alarm for our apoapsis here. I'll make sure this time that I'm doing it right. Yeah, okay, there, apoapsis. That apoapsis will raise our periapsis up a little bit because it is a little low. And then obviously a periapsis we'll get ourselves into a nice circular orbit and then we'll see where we're at okay I want to get this antenna down okay raise lower the antenna we are now just a few minutes away from periapsis don't need that long-range antenna so I just want to get rid of it okay according to Kerbal Engineer I have 767 meters per second left and my apoapsis is still 156 kilometers oh I don't like the looks of this Wait, what's this fuel tank? There's a fuel tank right there. Why do I have fuel there? That's on the rover. Oh my god. Oh, that's for the fuel cell. I got a fuel cell. And I was thinking ahead. Safety. Oh, screw safety now. I want that fuel. Oh, this is awesome. I don't think Kerbal Engineer is counting that fuel because it's on the other side of the decoupler. I think it's on the next stage. But right now we got... Uh, we're coming to periapsis. We best get our apoapsis down, and then we'll take a look at what our fuel situation is. Okay, that's an 11 by 11 kilometer orbit. That'll be good. What I'm really interested in is what will our delta V on Kerbal Engineer go up if I transfer this fuel out? Whoops. Let's select that again and pin it this time. I've got to transfer this fuel symmetrically evenly to the other two fuel cans or else my center mass will get thrown off. Thankfully, this works fairly well. Let's transfer. Oh yes, it is changing. Kerbal Engineer, it is changing and it is now 887 meters per second to get down to the surface. That's easy peasy. Now all I got to do is pick myself a landing spot. So, open this up. You know, we've had so many equatorial and polar orbits in this series. It's nice seeing this nice sine curve here now. Looks pretty. Anyway, I gotta pick myself a landing spot. All the waypoints that you see are all places I gotta go for contracts, you know, anomalies that I got to visit. So I have a few different options, but what I ended up going for is a waypoint here at Moon Arc number one. There are three biomes there that are pretty close together. Midlands, Midland Craters, and the Northwest Crater. Unfortunately, it was about a day and a half before it got to the point where the moon rotated so that that landing site was underneath our orbit. But once it was, we began to do our descent. And you've seen me do descents before, so I'm just going to cut down towards the end part of this. And the terrain most certainly looks unfriendly. I'm only about 30 kilometers away from the waypoint, but it's hard to sort of see exactly where it is. Let's pop out the map view again. Alright, it's just on the other side of this big crater that I'm coming up to. Oh yeah, I can see it now. It's on top of the ridge of that crater. Okay. Yeah, I gotta start killing my horizontal velocity here. Oh, jeez, I left it too late. 
smooth. Yeah, here we go. Blasting right over it. I can see the arch down there. <laughs> so my aiming was good. But uh, started that breaking too late. Now let's see here. Is there a nice... I think once we're sort of past this kind of ridge that's coming up here, I think it's actually all right. Let's start pitching up just a little bit more. I don't want to come down too fast. I think I'm coming towards a fairly flat spot. Not the most auspicious of landings here as far as accuracy goes, but we've got a car. <laughs> we don't have to stay here. We can drive. And let's touch down softly. No kind of landing gear. It's actually going to land, just rest on the fuel cans. And there we go. And with that done, we'll transfer the uh, remaining fuel out of those exterior tanks back into the rover for the fuel cell. But then, after that, all that's left to do is to separate. And we should be free and clear. Let's see if we can wiggle this guy out of here. The brakes are where the, the toggle up there by the altimeter doesn't work. Only the B button works. I don't know why. So eventually here I figure out to press B to turn the brakes off. There we go. And now we are rolling backwards. I gotta drive forward. Why why is this so awkward to drive? I'm pushing forward. Come on, drive. Oh wait a sec, the wheels are all whacked out. I think I'm controlling yeah, I gotta control from the uh, cockpit here now. I gotta put this into rover mode. And let's try this again. There we go. We are off. Excellent. We got about ten and a half kilometers. <laughs> Not my most auspicious landings in terms of accuracy, but we got a nice waypoint to follow here. Shouldn't be a problem. You might be noticing, by the way, uh, the sort of change in the size of the GUI. It, it happened quite suddenly just before I went to my ascent, and that's because I started playing with my screen resolution. I've always had this all the way through this series. My screen resolution, I ran it in a window at 900 by 600 pixels, uh, mostly because I was very much in the habit of having a uh, spreadsheet program <laughs> running beside me, and then I finally got it a little bit brighter and started running the spreadsheet program separately on a laptop. And uh, then I thought, you know, why don't I jack up the resolution? So now I got a full screen mode running at 1366 by 768. It does make all the menus smaller. So for you folks, I suppose it's all harder to read, but it does leave more real estate for what probably people are more interested in, which is in taking in these lovely vistas. And actually, this is kind of nice because I can sort of scout out a nice flat landing spot, a relatively flat landing spot for my lander. Over here looks quite a bit nicer. And once I got myself over there, it was time to put this thing in park. Where it'll form a nice target for our lander, but clearly that's going to have to be for a future episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.